Okay, hopefully you had time for a good afternoon coffee. Our next speaker is Stacy, who will tell us all about migrating to Azure. Stacy, good luck. Thank you very much. And good afternoon to everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Now, as developers, we want to work on the latest things to be able to keep our skills up to date and to try and use the best fitting technologies to solve our problems in the best possible way. And over the last decade or so, cloud solutions have come to fit this description more and more. And yet, being able to make use of these technologies is sometimes a lot harder than we'd really like it to be. Some larger, some older companies, they can still be really hesitant about this move to the cloud, whether that's through fear, lack of internal knowledge, or any other reason. We still have many developers finding themselves working on legacy in-house systems. Your code gets deployed but far too occasionally, with a lot more effort than you'd like, and you don't really have any control over how any of it is deployed. And should you need new hardware, can take months before that is available to you. you have been reading about Azure, about the cloud, you've been itching to give it a try. Maybe this is something that you can use to start working in that cloud native way. But again, getting that go ahead can be so hard. You find yourself being asked questions that maybe right now you can't specifically answer. Wouldn't it be cool to just quickly build something in order to try and get some of those answers and prove just what you can do? And at a previous employer, this is exactly the position that we were in. As a development team, we really wanted to use Azure we had a project that was screaming out for a cloud solution. It would have made our lives so much easier. But our ops team and our budgeting team said, absolutely not. Not until you can answer all of these questions. That's not totally unfair, of course. But there's always a question of what answers are acceptable. After all, there's reams of research on this not least of which the State of DevOps report, which continues to support the move to the cloud to allow companies to become more agile and be able to do things more fluidly for their users. But we're dealing with people here. And people need to have that personal knowledge about things which for them are unknown. They need to feel and see the results with their own eyes. And so we managed to organize a hack week a chance to show what we as developers could do in a short time frame with the whole team working together and show our costs at the end of the week. And when I say the whole team, I really mean the whole team. We had all of our development team, we got our ops team involved, our product owners to make sure that the things we were building, it was a real world thing. It wasn't just some vague tutorial idea. And today I'm going to run through a small part of one of the experiments that my team did over this hack week. Just a simple application that uses a couple of different resources in Azure to try and replicate something that we thought could really help our customers in the future. Hi, I'm Stacey Cashmore and I'm Tech Explorer DevOps at Omniplan in the Netherlands and I'm a Microsoft MVP in Developer Technologies. I've been developing software since the mid 1990s, and I've been dipping my toes into the cloud world over the last couple of years. Now, the app that I'm going to go through today and build with you, like I say, it's based on one of our experiments, and it's a simple way to get data from our user via a static Angular site and into Azure storage. Now, I have a couple of cravats before I start. I'm using Azure DevOps in order to get my code deployed to Azure for this demonstration, but I'm not going to be showing you my pipelines, I'm afraid. Also, due to time considerations, I'll admit I'm using a pre-made Azure environment in order to deploy my code. I'm doing this because creating resources can take time, and I'd rather spend our time together this afternoon showing you things rather than waiting for Azure to catch up with us. 
But don't worry, for every resource I use in my demo, I am going to walk you through creating it in the Azure portal. And finally, before we start, I'm afraid this is going to be a little bit of a pacey demonstration this, today. We have an amount to get through in the time we have available. But don't worry, there's a blog post available that goes through this in more depth about how to create the things I'm talking about. And in the next week or so, there's coming a follow-up to show you how you can deploy this to Azure from your machine. And um, that's also going to have links to the appropriate documentation so you can really explore yourself. Right, enough talk. Let's get on to the demonstration. Now, the first thing that I would like to show you today is just the application that we are going to be using in order to enter data into our system. This is just a very simple one page uh, Azure application. We simply allow people to sign up to a book club with their name, their email address, and the genre that they're interested in. Now, this application doesn't change at all this afternoon. The only thing that we're doing is changing the things on our Azure side, our API and the storage that we're going to have behind that. And the API, let's quickly take a look at that before we get started. This is pretty much as it comes out of the scaffolding when you create a new web API project. I've removed the weather forecasting service and associated classes because we don't need it. I have added my own model so that I can get my email, my name, and my genre from my users. And I have an empty controller, which is what we're going to start to change in a second. The last thing before we move on, the one change that I have had to do here is in my startup CS. Because I'm using a static Angular site, the URL is different to my API. And so I've had to enable cores because otherwise I can't talk to the API. With that out of the way, let's actually get building. Now, the first thing that I want to do today with you is run through the simplest possible way to get data into Azure storage. So what we're going to do is just take our user data and we are going to write that directly into table storage. So I'm just going to add a new folder here. We'll call that table access. And then I'm going to make a new class. And that we're going to call, when my machine catches up, storage table access. Now, you don't want to spend the next hour watching me mistype words. So I've got a few snippets that I'm going to copy across here, and I'm going to walk through them one by one with you. The first thing I want you to notice is this using statement at the top. We're going to be using the Microsoft Azure Cosmos table namespace. Now, it says Cosmos, but we're not using Cosmos DB. The API is shared between table storage and Cosmos, so we need to use this. Uh, you can also see a nice little red squiggly line underneath Azure, and that's because we need a Nugget package in order to use this. So let's quickly add that, and then we can get on with our code. Wait for that to come in. We'll install it. We will accept anything that it tells us to accept, because who reads this? And now we can take a look at our class. Now, the base of my storage table access class has two things, a connection string and a, and a table name. The table name we are passing in via the constructor. The connection string, I've done a very bad thing. It's just hard coded here. Please don't do this in production. Use Key Vault or whatever else to make sure that this stays safe. This is only here for the purpose of the demonstration. So this is our base class, but what do we need to do to insert data? Um, that's all we're going to be looking at today, just inserting data. We're not reading it out right now. And in order to insert data into a table, we have a function which takes a table entity. It's a special type of um, object that we can use to store data in table storage. And we're going to be getting access to our table from the Azure storage account. We are going to be making an insert operation based on the entity that we're passing in. And we're going to be execution, executing that insert statement against our table. Now, we have more squiggly lines, so there's more code snippets to come. How do we get our cloud table? Well, for that one, we have this snippet here, get table async. And we're returning a cloud table for our insert to use. And that's fetched using four different steps. First of all, we get our cloud storage account using the connection string that we have at the top of our class. Next, 
we create a cloud table client based on that cloud storage class that we're using. Then we get a reference to the table name that we passed into our constructor. And this bit's a little bit interesting because even if that table doesn't exist, you're going to get a reference back to it, which is great because it means we don't need to set up our storage account tables before we start coding. We can do a code first and it will be created for us, but only if we use the following line. Create, if not exists, async. And this does exactly what it says on the tin. It checks to see if your table exists. If it doesn't, it makes it for you. If you don't run this and your table doesn't exist, you're going to get errors when you try and run your code. So don't do that. And for our storage um, table access, this is all that we need. With this code, we can write things into our tables. But we do need an entity that we're going to sign in. So we're going to make another class in this folder. Add a second class, and that class is going to be our sign up entity. Now, for this, the base of our class, you can see we're still using that Microsoft Azure Cosmos table namespace, and we are making a class which is inherited from table entity. And table entity has two properties which have to be filled when you're storing data into the table. The first one is a partition key. How is our data going to be partitioned inside of our storage account? And the second one is the row key. Between these two fields, we get a unique reference to our data. Now, you can see that I wrap these inside of properties, and I've decorated those properties with the ignore property attribute. That is just because when I'm using this, I really don't like seeing partition key and row key spread throughout my code. I'd rather have something that's kind of closer to the, the domain I'm working in so that my code reads better. And the only thing that really needs to know about the partition key and row key is this class itself. Right now, of course, we're not actually storing any data because we don't have any data set up in this entity. So let's add that now. And here we have just our three properties, email, name, and genre that we're getting from our user. So a quick build to make sure that I've not done anything wrong. It seems to be working. Now we can actually use these classes in our controller to save the data that our user is sending to us. So in the function itself, we need two lines of code. And I'm just going to use control dot here to bring up my uh, context help, and we're going to import our using statement. So we're getting access to our book club signups table from our table access uh, class. And then we're going to insert the request that the user is passing in. But of course, this request isn't a table entity. It's not our signup entity. So we're going to need to do a little bit of adaption here. And again, I'm just going to put this adapt class directly into my controller. Not something I'd really do, but time for the demo. And this adaption, all we're doing is just copying the name, email, and genre from the request into our signup entity. And we're setting these two special fields that we had, the genre subscription and the unique name, the partition key and the row key. And I am using the genre that the user is interested in to partition my data. And the unique name, I am just cheating. In real life, you're going to be using much more complex uh, naming conventions in order to sort this data out and to make sure you don't have data clashes. Me, I'm just taking the ticks from date time now to make sure every request I send in is unique. One last build, make sure that's OK. And now we can push this up to Azure. I'll add the table and we will get push that. OK, just wait for that one to go out. Yep. Now, I just want to check that my pipeline is actually kicked off. Otherwise, it's going to be a really boring demonstration for you in a minute. That seems to be going. Now that we have our code available, while that's building and deploying, I want to go through creating the Azure resources we need in order to run the code that we've just written. Now, the first thing that we need is a resource group, which is used to group your resources. And it's a way of managing all of the Azure resources that you need for a service, a particular piece of functionality, an application. And it makes the management of those services easier, and it makes the management of the costs easier because you can see the cost roll up for your resource group. We're going to add a new one for our demonstration here. So we're going to come to this Add button on the side. 
And you can see the subscription has been pre-filled and we see a region underneath and a name that we need to enter. So let's give, see this is why I'm not live typing for my code. Let's give it a name of live demo and let's set the region. I'm in the Netherlands, so we're gonna set it to West Europe. Now the region on a resource group, it can confuse people sometimes. Uh, when you set it up, I initially thought when I first saw it, and I've known other people that did as well, that the region is kind of a default for everything that's inside of your uh, resource group. And it's nothing like that at all. What it is, it's where we store the metadata belonging to the resource group. And this can bring compliance issues. So if you have a limitation on where you can store this metadata in order to be compliant with your local laws, make sure you're setting this up in the right location. We're going to click on this review and create button, make sure I've not made any mistakes, and then click create. And there's our resource group. Now, my introduction, I said I'm using a pre made environment because creating stuff takes time, and this was just instant. Honestly, I'm not lying to you. Resource groups are the exception to the rule. I've never had them take more than a second to make. But now that we have our empty resource group, let's fill it with actual Azure resources. And we need three for the code that we've made so far. We need an app service plan, which is kind of the metal where we're going to run our application. We need a web app, which is kind of the IIS that our application is going to be running inside of. And of course, we need our storage account itself. Let's quickly add them now. We're going to go up to this button here and click Add. And let's start with the web app. So we can add this one first. We're just going to click on web app. And here we get the page to create it. Now you can see at the top, the subscription and resource group have been pre-filled because we created it from inside of our resource group. If you create a resource from outside of a resource group, you're going to have to check that you're adding it to the right one at this stage. Now we need to give it a name. Let's call it live. And you can see we can't just call it live because this name is how we access it from the outside world. This would be live dot azurewebsites.net and apparently somebody else is already using that already. What a surprise. This name has to be globally unique within Azure. So let's call that live demo web app and we can see a nice green tick here. We can use this. Now we're going to be publishing code. So we'll leave this one alone. We're going to be running .NET 3.1. We're going to be deploying to Windows. Of course, we could always de also deploy to Linux. It's .NET Core. There's a reason why I'm not doing that, and I'll get to that later on in the demonstration. And then we need to set our region. And you can see it's still Central US, even though my resource group is in West Europe. But let's add West Europe for our region for our web app as well. And then in the same screen, we can already create our app service plan, the metal that our application is going to run on. Now we're going to click on this create new button because I don't want to use any of my existing ones. We'll give that a name. And now we can uh, select the SKU and the size. How big a machine do we want in order to run our application? If we click on this change size, then we get all of these options available to us. And you can pick from here the size of machine that you need in order to run your application. Right down from a machine with one and three quarter gig of memory, which is around 62 euros a month, right up to a whopping P3 V3 with 32 gig, eight CPUs, and a whopping 833 euros a month. So you can see here, the smaller the um, machine you need in order to run your application, the less it's going to cost you, which kind of makes sense. Now, in order to develop and test and play around with things, I don't want to be spending 62 euros a month. So I'm going to come up to this dev test tab here. And here we have three cheaper options. We have a production-like option, which is 46 euros a month, or we have two shared infrastructure options. One is around eight euros a month and you get one gig of memory and 240 minutes of compute time. And you have one which is totally free, one gig of memory and 60 minutes of compute time a day. Now, don't let this 
uh, scare you or fool you if you're developing. That 60 minutes compute time does not mean that your web app is only available for 60 minutes a day. What it means is if you're calling your web app, you have 60 minutes of CPU time a day. So if your testing costs two minutes of CPU time an hour, you'd be using about 48 minutes in a day. For this demonstration, that is more than adequate. So this is what we're going to be picking. Now, I'm just going to click on this review and create again. And I'm going to run down and make sure I've not picked anything wrong. And then we're going to click the Create button. And now Azure will go off and it will create me an app service plan and then make me a web app inside of that app service plan. Now, if we go back to our resource group, you can see here I have nothing. This is why I'm not using this in order to deploy my demonstration to. It can take time. Let's add our storage account now. So we're going to go back to our Add button. We are going to come down to the storage account down here. And again, we can see that the subscription and the resource group are pre-filled for us. Now we just need to enter a few more details in order to get it created. So again, we can come down here. And you can see here, if we just put live, somebody's already used that. This has to be globally unique inside of Azure as well. So let's live demo storage. And here you can see we can only use lowercase letters and numbers in the names for our storage accounts. No Pascal case, no camel case, no kebab case. It just has to be a long string of lowercase words, I'm afraid. Live demo storage ACC, that seems to work. Now we need to set up the region that our storage account is going to be located in. And again, we're going to do West Europe here. There are two very important things we need to remember when we're setting the location for our storage accounts. The first one, the same as with the metadata for the resource group, is compliancy. If we are storing personal data about our users, then we have limitations on where we can store that personal data. I'm in the Netherlands. It's inside the EU. The personal data for my users also has to remain inside the EU. So that's why I'm picking West Europe. The other thing we need to consider is where our users are and where the metal is that we're talking from. So if your web apps are being ran in West Europe, you also really want your storage account in West Europe if you can. You have latency when accessing this data. And if you're accessing it within the same region, it's going to be milliseconds. It's going to be fine for most applications. If, on the other hand, I store my data on the other side of the world, that latency could go up to tenths of a second for the packets that are coming back. Our users are going to have a degraded experience. They're not going to be happy with us. So make sure it's close to the metal and make sure it's compliant. Next, we have our performance layer. I'm not going to talk too much about this. Standards cheaper, premiums faster. It's slightly more complex than that, but we'll leave it at that for today. Standard is fine for this demo. And then we have the type of account that we wish to create. We have blob storage, which is tailored for blobs. We have a storage general purpose v1 account. And that is for legacy use only. It's not something that you're probably going to be using for new development. And then we have our storage v2, general purpose v2 accounts. This gives us access to blobs, files, tables, and queues, which is perfect for what we're going to be doing today. So that's what we're going to select. Then we get onto our replication, and we have a few different options here that we can pick through. And I want to walk through each of them because it's an important decision that you need to make when creating your storage account. How do you want your data replicated? Now we have this option here, locally redundant storage, and that protects you against equipment failure in a data center. Your data is duplicated inside of a single data center. And if you have equipment failing, your data is duplicated, you'll still have access to it. And that's the cheapest option, which I think is quite cool. Our cheapest option we already have redundant data included. However, if a data center falls out, you're still going to lose access while it's not available. And if that isn't suitable for the uptime that you need for your application, then you can go up a notch to zone redundant storage. This is where we spread the data between different data centers inside of one zone. 
not only are we protected against equipment failure, we're now also protected against data center failure. Of course, it's not unheard of in the past to lose access to a region occasionally. And again, if your SLA demands that you can survive this and your app still runs, then you'll want to go up to the next level, which is geo-redundant storage. And this is where instead of spreading our duplicated data within a zone, we spread it across different regions. So if West Europe should fall out, uh, I believe the twin for West Europe is North Europe, and so my data would automatically fail over to a copy of that data located in North Europe. There's a small cravat here. You can only do this when Azure has noticed that there's a failover, and that can take an amount of time. If that is not suitable for you, or if you just want people in both regions to be able to read this data locally, then you can move up to the next step, which is read access geo redundant storage. This is exactly the same as the previous option, only now we can read the data in the second location all of the time. That means you can put data close to your users. It also means that you can have your own heartbeat against your data storage. And if you see a problem, you can do an automatic failover before Azure does it for you. Lastly, we have two new options. I believe they came available this year. I think they were in preview at the start of the year. They're now in general availability. GeoZone Redundant Storage, which is where we spread the data between both regions and zones. And finally, the best one to say in the live demonstration, because it's a bit of a tongue twister, the Read Access GeoZone Redundant Storage. And the same as between our GRS and our RA GRS, this is the same as the previous option, only you've got read access all of the time. You don't need to wait for an Azure failover for it to happen. After going through all of that, for our demonstration, we're just going to go for the cheapest here. We just want locally redundant storage. So let's do our review again, make sure that I've not done anything I didn't mean to, and then we'll create this. And now Azure will go away and it will create all of this for us, ready for us to use. You can see that our app service plan and web app is now available to us. We could have used it if we want to. Um, the last thing I want to show you before we actually try and enter some data is the current state of my Azure storage. So I'm going to come into my running demo resource group. This is my pre-made environment. And I have a storage account down here, Azure running demo. If I click on this, then we can see inside of our storage account. And what I want to show you is this option here, Storage Explorer, which is currently in preview. And it used to be that in order to see the data inside of your storage account non-programmatically, you needed to inst install the Storage Explorer locally and you needed to run it locally. Now, when you're developing software, you're probably still going to want to do this. But just for a quick access of data, this is fantastic. It's not book free, but it works well enough. Now, if I click on this, you can see inside my storage account, I have blog containers, file shares, queues, and tables. And what I want to show you is that I really don't have any data in there right now in my queues and tables. They're both empty. And that's important because I want to show you that these get created when I actually run my demo. All right, let's just check. My pipeline didn't fail. That seems to have passed OK. Let's make some test data. Now, for my test data, I'm going to be using Amy Pond. And Amy, she's traveling on the TARDIS. And the genre that she's really interested in is 40s crime noir. That's what she wants updates on. So let's submit this now. Go back to our storage account. Refresh. And with any look, if it's all gone right, I now have my table, my book club signups. And I've got Amy in my database. And that is how simple it can be. Just a few lines of code is all you need to get started with playing with this. But this has a few issues with it uh, regarding resilience and scalability. And that is because, obviously, right now, we're just simply throwing data at a table. But in real life, when somebody signs up, you're going to be doing way more than that. And all of this can take time. And all of this can go wrong. And if it goes wrong, we don't want Amy to get a 500 error back. We want her to think that we're awesome. And we want to deal with any problems that happen. So we want to disconnect that for her. 
The other thing is, if our book club gets popular, and why wouldn't it? AIM is a member of our book club. Everybody's going to be signing up. That would mean we're going to have to scale up our web app, which is a more complex issue than it could be. And it can get expensive, as you've seen in the options available for the size of the web app, in order to cope with this increased demand. And it's, it's hassle that we don't want. So what we're going to do now is change the way that we're storing data. We're going to make the API as simple as possible, and we're just going to put data into a queue. We're then going to write an Azure function to read that queue and put that data into the table for us. So if we go back to our code, we're going to make a new folder inside of our solution. And we are going to call that when I get my mouse back. To helper. And we're going to make a new class inside of there for actually using our queue. So we're going to make a class, and that's going to be called queue access. And you may have guessed it, there's a code snippet coming. If my mouse does what it's supposed to do on the other screen. So now you can see we're no longer using the Cosmos table namespace. We're now using the Azure storage queues namespace. And you can see we've got a red line again. We need another nugget package. Let's quickly add that now. So we'll just do a quick search for that. And we're going to install the latest version. It's important we install the latest version. I'll come to why in a couple of minutes. Now, at first glance, this class looks fairly similar to the other one. We have a connection string. And then instead of a table name, we have a queue name, which we pass into the constructor. Again, my connection string, I put it straight into my class. Don't do this in real life. Um, but now we have something that we can add to in order to add a message to a queue. So we do that with three steps. The first thing we need to do is get a queue client. Then we need to uh, encode our message in JSON. And our message we're passing in is a plain old object. We don't have a queue entity like we have a table entity. We can pass anything into here as long as it serializes we can push it onto our queue. And then the last step is just sending this message asynchronously up to the top, up to the queue. Now you can see we've got a couple of squiggly lines here, so let's get the rest of the code across. The first one is, how do we actually get our queue client? And it's kind of similar to how we got the table client with one step less. The first thing that we need to do is get access to a queue service client from our connection string. Then we get access to our queue client using the queue name we passed into the constructor of our class. And again, we can get access to a queue that doesn't exist. If you remember my storage account, I don't have any queues yet, but we're going to deploy that. And so we still need to run this create, if not exist, async on that queue to make sure that this queue does exist. And this is why you need the latest version of the Nugget package. I believe it was 12.3, which was released in March 2020, which gave this functionality. In previous versions, you have to write this yourself. And why do we want to write something ourselves? If we can use something Microsoft's written for us, it's less testing, it's less hassle. The last thing that we need to do is add the base64 string. And I've kept this separately because I just want to mention it very briefly. In a previous um, Nugget package that we used to access, uh, queues, it automatically encoded everything in base64 for us. In fact, it did it by default. Many people didn't even know it did it. In the new version, that doesn't exist yet. And you don't find out until later in the process that something's wrong because it will build, it will deploy, you can send messages to it, you will see the messages visible, readable inside of that storage explorer. But when you try and read it with a function, it's going to crash on you because that function except expects a base64 string, and this didn't have it. So this is all that we need in order to send a message up to our queue. So we can now use this inside of our controller. And we're going to do a little bit of cleanup as well, because we don't need all of this complexity that we have here now. We can get rid of our adaption. We can replace these two lines with one. I'm just going to do that control dot again, just to bring up my helper menu and import the namespace. 
We want acute access for book club signups, all lowercase again, kind of like the uh, storage account itself. You can't use capitals here. And we're going to add our request. And you see, no adaption. Our book club signup request comes in, and we pass it straight through. So a quick build to make sure I've not done anything wrong. That builds. And now we can push this up to Azure. So change table for Q. Commit all and push. Now, again, once this is pushed, I just want to make sure that my pipeline kicks off again so that I can show you it working in a second. And now that that's building, now we're going to start to build our Azure function. And this is how we're going to get the data out of that queue and put it into our table storage. Now, we're going to start a new project here. And we're just going to get some data from my other screen. So we're going to create a new project. This project is going to be an Azure Functions project. And we're going to give it a name. And so that my build pipelines and everything else work, I need to put this in a very specific place on my machine. So let's add that. And then we can create the project. The first thing we have to do is put the scaffolding that we want for our Azure function. Now, you can have an empty function where you have to do everything yourself. We can have blob triggers, Cosmos DB triggers, event, tri event grid triggers. You can even have a HTTP trigger. I didn't actually need to write that whole web API in order to do something so simple. There's a reason why I did. Again, we'll come back to that later on. The trigger that we want, though, for now is this queue trigger. And there's a few things we need to set up in order to get it working. The first thing we're going to do is connect it up to our Azure running demo account that I just showed you on the screen. This connection string setting name, that's if you're running with multiple different storage accounts that you want to talk to. You'll put your connection string in here, and you'll be able to use it. I'm cheating. I'm just using the one that's defaultly associated with my function. It's a bit of an abuse of Azure, but it works nice enough for demonstrations. And then we need to say what queue we want our trigger based on. So that's going to be our book club signups. Now we can create our function. So while that scaffolds the function, I've just a few more things I want to bring across. Because I want to do a little bit of cleanup, I don't like having just function one in my code, not even for a demonstration. So we're going to rename this to book club signup function. And we're going to let Visual Studio rename the class for us. And we're going to change this attribute to also be book club signup function. Now, this function name attribute, this is how you see your function inside of the Azure portal. This can't have spaces in it. I found out the hard way. I put a space in one of mine by mistake. It built, it deployed, I got no errors, it didn't appear in the Azure portal, and it didn't fire. And I spent an hour pulling my hair out before I noticed the space in this name. Don't be me, don't do that. Then we need to do just a little bit of cleanup here. This connection, that is for the connection string that we could have put in in the scaffolding. So we can remove this now, and then it will just use the default storage account of the function itself. And then we can see we get passed in a string called my queue item. And this string will be our um, JSON object that we've stored. It's already been uh, de encrypted from the base64. We just get a JSON string. We can just deserialize that into an object and use it. But we don't need to deserialize it ourselves. Azure will do that for us if we tell it what to deserialize it to. Again, code we don't have to write is good code. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of cheating here because you've already seen me copy paste enough code. And I don't think you want to watch me do the same thing a second time. So I'm just going to take some of the code that we've just written for the controller, and I'm going to bring it straight into my function here. I brought in my model, my book club signup. I'm just going to change the namespace to match the project that we're in now. And I'm going to do the same for my to, my to table access classes. We'll just bring these across and this one. And we can see that we've got this red squiggle again because, of course, we need to add this nugget package again. So let's quickly do that one too. So we will add our, not a file, we will go to the 
nugget. We will search for the Cosmos table, and we're going to install the latest stable version. And accept everything again, because we always just click I accept, don't we? So now that should install, it should get rid of all of the things that we have. Let's just do a quick build to make sure it's OK. Seeded. Now we can change our book club sign up function to pretty much match what we had in our controller previously. So we're going to bring some lines across that we had before. And of course, we also need the adapt function. So we'll just bring this in here. And we're going to import the namespaces that we need. Again, control dot, it's wonderful for this. It saves you so much time. And uh, the other thing that we need to do is deserialize what we're getting into our function. So we're just going to put in there our book club sign up request. And we'll rename this to request so that it matches the rest of our code. Now we still have some red squiggles here, and that's because a function is static. So this function here also needs to be static. And the last one, we have an asynchronous call. So we need to add async to our function. One last check that built, and that's it. This code that you've seen me add here is exactly the same as the code that it was before. The scaffolding does the rest, and we now have a function that we can deploy. So let's push that up. Add function. So we're going to commit all and push that. Wait for it to disappear again, and then we'll check that our pipeline's kicked off. So we now have a different pipeline which is being queued and built. That's good. Why that's building, the previous one worked. So let's add some more data here. Now, Amy has a husband, Rory. Rory is also traveling on the TARDIS, but Rory's not interested in Forty's Climb Noir. Rory is interested in Roman history. So let's sign him up to that book club. We'll submit that. If we go back to our storage account now, hopefully we're going to see that we have a queue. And here is Rory waiting to be added to our table. And that's going to happen when the function is deployed and kicks off. While that's being deployed and kicked off, let's add a function to our live demo resource group. So we're going to come back to the live demo resource group. You can see that we now have our storage account, our app service plan, our web app. We have application insights available to us for our web app. Now we just need the function to add to it. So we're going to click on that plus button again in the corner, the add button, and we're going to click on function app. Again, we have our subscription. We have our resource group. That's pre-filled because we came from the resource group. If you come from outside, you're going to have to set it yourself. We need to give our function app a name. And you can see here we have azurewebsites.net again. This has to be globally unique, the same as our web app does, because this is how it's visible to the outside world. And as this is also as your websites, your web app can also not be the same as your function. They have to be different. So let's call this one. Live demo function app, and that one works for us. That's good. We are deploying code again. We're going to be deploying .NET Core 3.1. And again, we need to say that we're running in West Europe. Now we need to have a look at how we're going to host our function. And there's three things that we need to set here. We need to give it a storage account. And for that, we're going to use the live demo storage account that we created in the previous step. Then we need to pick the operating system, Windows. I'm going to come to that in a second. And then we need to pick the type of plan that we're going to use. We have three options. Consumption, which is serverless. Every time your uh, function times out, when it's idle, it's going to be torn down. And when the next request comes in, it has to be rebuilt before it fires. Then we have premium. And that's where, uh, I believe in the simplest sense, you always have a cold um, scale out function ready to go. So if you're idle, when you get a request in, you just have to spin up that cold instance and you automatically get a second cold instance. So if you need to scale out, it can happen much quicker than in the consumptionless model, or you can run it on an app service plan itself. We're going to be running on consumptious consumption. And like I say, that means that when your function is idle, it gets ripped, it gets torn down. 
when you get your first request in, it has to be rebuilt. For that reason, the storage account has to be in the same region as your function because you don't want the latency of copying all of this code across around the world to rebuild your function app. It's also the reason why I'm not using a function app for my API because building it can take time and I want this particular function to be a little bit snappy and so I want it to respond straight away. I don't want the risk of my user thinking, well, what's happening whilst my function app is being built up. And finally, why am I using Windows? Because of a limitation within Azure. If you have a consumption app service plan, which is what our function is going to be running on, and you're running on Linux, that can be the only app service plan in your resource group, which means I couldn't have run my web API on a different app service plan. Obviously, I could have deployed this to two resource groups and that would have solved the issue, but I don't want to do that for a demonstration, so I'm just using Windows for simplicity. We'll do our review and create and make sure that that's valid. And then we're going to click deploy, create, and that's going to make our function app and our consumption app service plan for us. Now, whilst we've been doing that, how has our deploy gone? It deployed. Hopefully it was successful. Let's take a look at our, our running demo resource group. If we go to my function, you can see my function here, and this is the consumption app service plan that it's running on. If we come into here, on this side, you can see this functions option. And here we should be able to see that I have a book club signup function with a queue trigger and it's enabled. Has it been spun up yet? Let's find out. This is always the terrifying part of the demo. This takes time, so it might not work. So if we come back into our storage account, go into our storage explorer, look at our queue, and our queue is empty. That's brilliant. It's been picked up. It's already spun up. And if we check into our table, Rory is now in our data table with Amy, ready to receive that update from the book club. So let's get back to our presentation. Now, one of the things that we had to do when we had our hack week and we ran through this and figured out what we needed to do is we wanted to look at what it was going to cost us in order to deploy to Azure. Basically, our budgeting team had visions of Azure bills of hundreds of thousands of euros a month coming in, as opposed to what we were spending on our own data center. And let's start small scale. This demonstration that I've just showed. In writing this talk, with lots of practice, with lots of dry runs, and lots of mistakes, and the other times that I've given this talk so far this year, I have spent a total of six euro cents. This is actually a lie, because I believe I've spent eight or nine euro cents now. This slide was written a couple of months ago. But basically, by using the Azure price calculator and figuring out the minimum resources I needed in order to run what I wanted to run, I managed to keep my cost really, really low. But of course, this is a tiny experiment and it's only a subsection of what you're going to be running in production. So what about for a bigger group? Well, in our hack week, for the entire department, six teams, 35 different developers, using lots of different resources. This was only a tiny part of what we did in that week. We were using machine learning, Azure Signal R services, logic apps, all sorts of different things in order to make our applications work and try and show the business just why we thought we could provide so much value with Azure. And not only that, the week before we actually had the hack week, we also had a week setting up the Azure subscription, making sure our VPNs work letting our ops team play and have a look around, setting up a workshop so that those developers who hadn't used Azure yet could kind of get a grounding before we threw them in at the deep end and say, hey, try something. And for both of those weeks, we spent a total of 25 euros. It really wasn't much. Now, don't get me wrong. 
you really do have to be careful when you are making something in the cloud. If you do something wrong, you can accidentally get a really, really, really big bill. And at the time when you get the bill, it's too late. It's got to be paid. But if you keep an eye on your costs, if you think about what the minimum is that you need to run your application, you can get an awful lot of value without spending a fortune on what you're doing. So I invite you to play, experiment, try things out in Azure. If you are lucky enough to have an, a Visual Studio subscription on a yearly basis, then you have Azure credit somewhere between 45 and 130 euros, depending on the level of subscription you have. Every month of your subscription. If you have this, use it. The best thing here is even if you do something wrong and you try and spend a fortune, and I've done this, you're only going to have to wait till your next billing period. Once you reach your credit limit, it just shuts down your account. You can no longer run anything until you get your next amount of credit from Microsoft. It's a pain. It's far better than getting a massive bill. If you don't have that um, position of being lucky enough to have one of these subscriptions, of course, you can still take your, Azure, your own Azure subscription. You're still going to get, or you get 12 months of selected services for free. In your first month, you get 170 euros of credit, which again is a credit limit on the account. So when I signed up, at least, if you did something wrong, you were only going to hit that credit limit. You weren't going to hit your credit card for the first month. And then you can play with it. Now, this is a more dangerous route. If you make a mistake after that first month, it is your credit. So please, 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 if you do this, use that as your pricing calculator and do your research. Make sure you know what you're creating before you hit that button. But it does have an advantage of running your own account, and that is you can actually try stuff in real life. You can run it in production, your own website. Uh, this demonstration is run on my personal subscription. It's not run on my Visual Studio subscription. I like to put my money where my mouth is. I also have my website also runs inside of my private subscription. It costs me literally nothing per month because of how I run it. So hopefully, now that you've seen how few lines of code you need to get this going and how simple it can be to get something running in the cloud, Go have a play. See what you can build. See how much value you can add with as little code and money as possible. Now, I know that that was a really fast run through. So again, if you go to my Dev2 page, you'll see this tutorial set up. What's there right now is how to run it locally. And in a couple of weeks, I'm going to be releasing the next step of the tutorial, which is how to get it into Azure itself. Thank you very much for your time. And does anybody have any questions? If I look in the Q&A section, I don't see any questions in there yet. I don't think there are any questions. Uh, thank you, Stacy, for your introduction to Azure. You're welcome. It's uh, thank you very much for having me.